Good evening. Good evening and welcome to the series of Critical Global Conversations at Penn Law. The Critical Global Conversation series at Penn Law helps to bridge the world of policymaking and academia, and these conversations provide a parallel forum on the margins of ongoing public dialogue on pressing issues of the day. And nothing can epitomize this series as well as tonight's conversation with our distinguished guest, Ambassador David O'Sullivan, on the recently negotiated TPP and the ongoing negotiations on the TTP. A central goal of the TTIP negotiations is enhancing the ability of small and medium-sized enterprises to participate in transatlantic trade. And that is why we are so happy to welcome guests from the mayor's office and the local government officials here in Philadelphia. So thank you for being here with us tonight. Tonight's distinguished interlocutors are Professor Jill Fish, who is a preeminent scholar whose work focuses on the intersections of business and law and is the co-director of the Institute of Law and Economics, a joint research center of the law school, the Wharton School, and the Department of Economics at the University of Pennsylvania. The institute is a leading voice in the field of law and economics. Professor Bill Burke White straddles the world of academia and foreign policy and multilateral diplomacy. He co-authored the quadrennial report, Secretary Clinton's Hallmark Foreign Policy Initiative, and serves, as Penn, serves both at Penn Law and at the university as the founding head of Perry World House, a unique think tank at an academic institute. David O'Sullivan, as ambassador of the European Union to the United States, represents not just one entity, but 28 divergent member states. He is a distinguished diplomat and premier negotiator. Negotiations is not new to him. He has successfully negotiated several trade deals with Asia and negotiated a significant EU presence in the ASEAN. We are honored that the ambassador found time to visit Penn Law during such challenging times. These are testing times for the EU and for the world. We live today in a time of crisis. This conversation takes place on the shadows of one of the biggest crises of our time. More people have been uprooted from their homes than at any time since World War II. Trade is a key policy issue of the 21st century. But as Deputy Secretary Jan Eliasson of the United Nations said last week, for many years, governments have worked to establish clear rules for cross-border trade, finance, and services. Yet, the cross-border movement of human beings remains insufficiently regulated and managed. But no one understands the importance of the EU and US relations, as well as Ambassador O'Sullivan. Ambassador O'Sullivan, you often speak of US and the EU as the first and foremost partners. And you speak of our shared values and our shared identity. You have drawn parallels with Europeans who came to America in the 17th century and the European integration as both attempts to reinvent themselves. Perhaps the migrant crisis too will result in a reinvention. No one appreciates the views of young leaders as Ambassador Sullivan. At a student conference organized recently at Yale University, you took very seriously the recommendations of Yale graduates for a European version of Americo and Teach for America. And you said, youth are tremendously important in sustaining and growing the transatlantic relationship. Ever increasing levels of commitment by successive generations have brought us to where we are now. And the role of the Minnellians is and will be to make sure the relationship continues to broaden and deepen. Ambassador Sullivan, you are in the right place. Here at Penn, our students are ready to take on the big challenges of our time at the forefront of international debate. Let the conversation begin. So, Mr. Ambassador, I think we'd love to start by giving you a, a few minutes to sort of reflect on, uh, on the issues that are on your mind at the moment as the representative of the EU in the United States. 
Well, that's a rather large. You know, <laughs> <laughs> but I'll, I'll try to I'll try to frame. Firstly, thank you very much uh, for being here, and uh, great to have this opportunity for what I hope will be an interactive dialogue, uh, I, not a monologue. I'd like to hear from you and answer answer questions. Um, where to start? Well, I mean, since we're talking about trade, let's maybe just begin with that. Uh, I studied economics. Uh, I'm highly skeptical. It's certainly a dismal, uh, a dismal subject. Uh, whether it's a dismal science, I'm not entirely convinced. Uh, uh, but there's only one law of economics that I'm convinced is actually irrefutably true in the way that some laws of the physical sciences are true, and that's the law of comparative advantage. Which is, if you uh, even if you were a country which hypothetically could make everything better than every other country, it would be in your best interest to focus on what you really do best and import the rest. And that both enriches yourself and it enriches your neighbors. And I believe that the whole of human history has been in the ability of trade to grow uh, our common economic well-being. There is no history, there is no example in history of uh, an autarkic success. No country has ever made the transition from poverty to prosperity other than by engaging with the global economy. And that doesn't mean that trade is not also a disruptor. Uh, it disrupts incumbents. Uh, it can create uh, problems for specific sectors. It can create problems for specific regions. A region can find it's devastated, itself devastated by the closure of a factory which is no longer competitive when you open your markets. There can be sectors of the economy uh, who are inefficient and who, once exposed to international competition, can no longer continue. So there will be people displaced, uh, and you have to have policies to deal with that. I'm, I'm not an, a, a sort of uh, fervent believer in free trade, uh, full stop. Uh, I think you need public policies to accompany the adjustment costs which come with free trade. You need education and training, you need regional investment programs, you need to help uh, areas, cities reinvent themselves if they're losing out. One thing is absolutely clear to me, though, that if you try artificially to preserve those jobs by closing your frontiers, sooner or later you're still going to lose the jobs and you're going to end up paying a higher cost because you won't have had the gains uh, of the efficiency of uh, trade. And that, I think, has been the whole history of the second half of the 20th, 20th century. Uh, the multilateral trading system, which was set up after the Second World War, the General Agreement on Tariff and Trade, uh, is the cornerstone of the prosperity, certainly of the Western world, uh, in, in the second half of the, the 20th century. Of course, it started with 20 countries. It now has 163 countries. And one of the big debates uh, in what is now the WTO, no longer the GATT, which was created uh, in 1993, uh, is whether those rules adequately reflect also the interests of the emerging economies and the developing economies. And that, to a certain extent, has been the whole debate uh, about the uh, Doha development agenda, the latest uh, multilateral round of negotiations, which have been stalled for some time, uh, precisely over this issue. Uh, can we find agreement on an asymmetric multilateral opening of tariffs uh, which, would feel, which would make the developing countries, and in particular the emerging developing countries, take greater ownership of the rules? And frankly, we haven't been able to find that balance. Uh, and that's why the multilateral track has been blocked for some time. Uh, I personally believe that the multilateral is always going to be preferable to the bilateral. Uh, it's true in terms of you know, macroeconomic analysis or econometric analysis, but I think it's also true more generally. It is also true, however, that not only have we had the, the, the multilateral track blocked, but it's also true that, frankly, the agenda of the World Trade Organization uh, is rather limited when you look at the modern economy. Uh, it does not enable you to address uh, many of the issues which are actually key to the removal of trade barriers. It, it focuses mainly on tariffs, on services, on the traditional areas but it does not include investment, it does not include competition policy, it does not include intellectual property rights. And increasingly, these are also the challenges of building uh, an equitable and uh, a fair uh, international trading system. So it's not surprising that we have all therefore gone down the bilateral track of trade negotiations. And that's where we are today. Uh, the European Union uh, has been negotiating. We changed our position in 2006. Uh, to begin uh, trade negotiations with a range of partners, India, South Korea, uh, Singapore. We've concluded with Singapore, we've concluded with South Korea, we've not concluded with India. Uh, we've been negotiating now since 2006, a uh, tough negotiation. Uh, I believe we will conclude it, uh, but it's taking time. Uh, we have done trade agreements with uh, um, uh, 
Central America, with uh, Peru, with Colombia. Uh, and we are now actively engaged. We've just concluded one of the most ambitious free trade agreements ever agreed between OECD countries with Canada. Uh, we're upgrading our uh, existing uh, free trade agreement with Mexico. We're upgrading our existing free trade agreement with Chile. We're negotiating with Mercosur in South America. We're negotiating with Japan. We're negotiating with a number of the ASEAN countries. Uh, and we would ultimately like to have an overarching uh, EU-ASEAN free trade agreement. And we've just announced this week that we will also launch negotiations with Australia, New Zealand, uh, and the Philippines and Indonesia. So we have probably one of the most ambitious free trade agendas in the world. When we're finished with all of these <coughs> negotiations, the European Union will be at the center of the world's largest free trading hub the world has ever seen. Uh, the United States, of course, in parallel, has been negotiating uh, the, the Pacific uh, deal, which we're very pleased to see was, was agreed two weeks ago uh, with 11 Pacific countries, representing some 40% of global trade. And, of course, uh, the, the mother of all trade negotiations is actually between the two biggest elephants in the, in the trading world, the, the EU and the US. Uh, the European Union is the largest economy in the world, as I like to remind my American friends when they, <coughs> when they argue with China over who's got the biggest economy, it's a fight over second and third place. But the fact is, even if America was in third place, uh, EU-US trade agreement would be the biggest trade agreement the world has ever seen. The transatlantic uh, economic corridor is the, 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 the single largest economic corridor in the world. We are both much more heavily invested in each other than either of us are in anywhere else. One small example, US companies make more money out of their investments in Belgium than they do out of their investments in China. Uh, China, we're the largest export market for China, uh, but what we trade with the United States uh, is, is multiples of that. We create 15 million jobs uh, transatlantically by our respective investments. Uh, we're by far the largest foreign investor in the United States. The United States is by far the largest foreign investor in Europe. So it makes sense to try to build a bilateral trading uh, arrangement between us, uh, dealing with traditional issues, of course, tariffs, services, public procurement, uh, IPR, all the things that you would expect to find, uh, uh, investment, uh, all the things you would expect to find in, in, a, in a modern 21st century trade agreement, but with one additional element which is new, which is regulatory cooperation. One of the biggest barriers to, to trade across the Atlantic is, is or, or adding costs to the cost of doing business across the Atlantic is indeed the um, regulatory duplication on both sides of the Atlantic. We both have similar, very high standards for environment, for consumer health, for safety, uh, labor standards, but we frequently uh, make companies duplicate their testing even when testing to the same high standards. Uh, automobiles is a classic example, uh, but uh, uh, for example, things like putting on the market of pharmaceutical products, we, we, we both have very similar uh, clinical and other tests which are required to be done, but if those have been done in Europe, they're not accepted by the FDA as an input to getting the product on the market here, and vice versa. So the question is, can we put together a, a, a better interoperability of our respective regulatory systems in order to reduce costs without lowering standards, without lowering uh, the quality uh, or the consumer health or the environment standards that are so important to our people on both sides of the Atlantic, and without undermining the autonomy of uh, the uh, regulators on either side, because re American regulators are not going to accept that Europeans dictate their standards, Europeans are not going to accept that American regulators dictate the standards. On the other hand, if we've done enough work between us, it may be that what you've done to comply with American standards can simply then be taken over, copy-pasted into uh, a European decision <coughs> to approve a product and vice, and vice versa, and we think that could be, could be a net gain. Why do all this? Because, frankly, it will grow our economies. Uh, we will both benefit. Uh, I, I'm skeptical of the econometric modeling that tells you exactly how much you get from a trade deal because I, I'm, you know, they're never very precise uh, and general equilibrium models of, of econometric modeling I'm skeptical of. But it will, you know, we're the biggest economies in the world and if we, if we open our economies still further to each other, you can be sure the net gain is going to be positive and possibly very significantly so. I believe the rest of the world will also benefit just as I believe Europe will benefit from what's happening in the Pacific deal. Uh, I believe the, the Pacific deal will benefit from the Atlantic deal, and the US will benefit from our deals in Asia, and we benefit from what the United States does, does elsewhere. Uh, uh, of course, at some point, should we go back and multilateralize all this? Maybe, uh, but complicated given the constraints in the WTO about the subject matter. Now, finally, to come back to the challenge of uh, Ranjita to sort of connect all these dots to what's happening in Syria, what's happening in, in Ukraine, uh, what's happening with migration. Um, I think, firstly, that ultimately for Europe, as for the United States, 
I think one of the big challenges is to have a, a prosperous and functioning economy, uh, which is absolutely indispensable to the functioning of our democratic systems. Uh, if we're experiencing on both sides of the Atlantic a certain disillusionment with politics, it's in part because people actually feel politics is not necessarily delivering uh, in terms of the quality of their lives. The economy may be growing, but it's not necessarily felt that this is widely shared. I think trade deals and trade increased trade openness can help change that, can create more jobs, uh, can create better jobs, frankly, because both of us are looking for jobs at the high end of, of the market, not at the low end. We can't compete uh, on wages against uh, the rest of the world. Uh, so it's all about value added. 60% of what we import in Europe is an input to what we export. Uh, so imports are just as important and low value or low, low cost imports are hugely important to, to our economic success as they are to the US's. But it's our ability to, to add value, to create uh, new products and, and, and designs that, uh, that people want globally, uh, that's going to be uh, our, our respective challenge. In all of this, however, there is the question of global inequality, there is the question of the space for the emerging countries of the world to grow, the developing economies, China is going to be a huge player, but Japan, I mean, I lived in Japan in the 80s, we were all afraid Japan would take over the world, now we're sorry they didn't. Uh, <laughs> we, we might live to regret that China is not being as successful as we one time feared it might be. Chris Patton, uh, former governor of Hong Kong and European commissioner, used to say the only thing that should scare you more than a, not, than a, than a successful China would be an unsuccessful China. We need the developing countries to be a success because we also need them to be able to offer a perspective of a decent life and, and, and a decent future to their people. Uh, there's plenty, we have a crowded planet, but there's plenty of prosperity there for everyone to benefit from if we get it right. Uh, that takes you into things like climate change, how we manage uh, with a population of nine billion, and it takes you into what we do about war and destruction uh, and the enormous difficulties in which some people on this planet live through failed states, failed states like Syria, failed states like Eritrea, uh, uh, like Somalia, uh, Central African Republic. There are many, many millions of people, there are 60 million displaced people in the world at the moment uh, because of conflict uh, and civil war and, and destruction. Uh, these people have a right also to a future uh, and we have to figure out how we're gonna manage that. At the moment we're faced with a major crisis in Europe because of the crisis in Syria. Uh, I think that we have responded. Uh, I, I think we've responded in many ways with great generosity, but not without some of the tensions that come with dealing with these issues. Uh, the capacity of any society to absorb uh, uh, immigrants is not unlimited, uh, and you need to manage also the domestic politics of it. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do in Europe. But this is a global problem, frankly. The Syrian problem is a shared problem of the international community, not just the countries of the immediate neighborhood, <coughs> Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey, who are doing a fantastic job receiving many millions of, of migrants, the, the, the Gulf states, the Arab states, the United States. Uh, we really need everyone to pitch in and try and help uh, solve the, the political problem in Syria, but also offer a decent perspective to the displaced people of Syria, either of a temporary home outside of the region or of a future in their own country. Uh, and that's part of the, the trade challenge. That's where the politics and the economics come together. I think I've spoken for closer to the seven minutes of the five. <laughs> I, will, I will stop there because I really want this to be a conversation. Um, the immigration issue is obviously something that we have heard a lot of debate about just in the United States. And I think the immigration issue and the trade issue uh, have a commonality in that the reaction of a lot of people is, what's the effect going to be on jobs? Can you talk a little bit more about uh, the concerns that we've heard expressed and the extent to which you think the negotiations will adequately address those concerns? You mean what, what effect will the, the trade Well, I mean, I, I, I think that uh, trade always creates more jobs and more employment than it destroys. But as I said in my introductory remarks, that is not to say that there are not some people who will be displaced by trade liberalization. The jobs which are destroyed may not be the same as the jobs which are created, uh, either in terms of regions or in terms of sectors. And that does create a challenge of public policy that you have to be able to respond uh, and you have to be able to uh, have the policies in place which enable people to retrain, to re-educate, uh, or which puts some additional investment, either private investment or public investment, I'm indifferent as to which, but which puts investment. 
which puts investment uh, into regions which are uh, which may be adversely affected because they're heavily dependent on on some industry which finds itself uh, threatened by as a result of, of, of opening up markets. But I'm absolutely convinced that with trade, as with immigration, the net, the net result is positive. But it's the politics of getting there. One of the things that depresses me a little in, in the debate here in the United States around trade promotion authority is the notion that NAFTA somehow was not a success for the United States. NAFTA was a huge success for the United States. NAFTA has been a huge success for the three countries involved. Uh, of course, it has had the effects I've described, which is some uh, uh, disturbance of the prevailing economic order, but the net result is usually positive. Now then, has the public policy response to that been, been adequate? Well, that's, that's the debate you need to have. But the notion that you can hide behind tariff walls or barriers and somehow grow a healthy economy is, in my view, something we know doesn't work. And if sooner or later, those inefficiencies are going to reveal themselves, you're going to lose those jobs, and you may even have lost the benefit of the, the alternative jobs that could have been created by, by opening, up, opening up your market. On, on, on migration, I mean, with just one sort of semantic clarification. The situation, I, I'm a great believer in, in immigration. Yeah, being Irish, how could I not? Uh, <laughs> uh, but I think it's, what we're dealing with is separate. We're dealing with a refugee crisis. So this is not economic migration. I mean, there are elements of economic migration perhaps mixed in with the refugee crisis. But this is primarily a crisis about people who are driven out of their homes by violence, uh, by state violence, or by terrorism, uh, and who have nowhere else to go. Uh, who are not leaving by choice because they, 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 they want a better job. They, they, their houses are being bombed. They, they, their lives are threatened. And the international obligation on the rest of us is to offer these people shelter unconditionally, uh, and not to debate whether they add more or less to our, to our economy. I believe if they stay, they will also contribute to the economy and it could be a plus viewed in a, in a, in a, in a sort of bigger picture. But in the short term, this is a crisis of, of refugee and asylum uh, and that puts a, the, the legal status of the debate quite differently. Yeah, I think that's absolutely fair. Judge Parker was here giving some remarks last week and made exactly that point with a lot of data to back it up, that the immigrants who come, including the immigrants who come for economic reasons, wind up on net being much more productive rather than being a drain on the economy. Absolutely. I wanted to talk a little bit about the big news of this week, which is that TPP got concluded, which many of us were skeptical would ever happen. and. But as you reminded us in your opening remarks, the U.S.-European trade uh, area uh, would be, if we got a, a TTIP done, the largest uh, agreement in the world. And I'm wondering, first of all, do you see the conclusion of TPP creating new energy or uh, impetus for uh, TTIP? Um, and I also wonder, you know, you'd, in some ways you'd think that it would have been easier to start with our closest allies with whom we share not just economic uh, interests but also lots of common values and get TTP done before doing TPP. But I wonder if in some ways you think it's a, it's a harder deal to strike precisely because of the depth of cooperation that is envisioned in TTP, some of the regulatory issues and so forth. Uh, and so kind of what's your sense after TPP is done about the prospects for TTIP? Well, I mean, the fact is, you started the, the Pacific negotiations, uh, in fact, under George Bush uh, six years ago. So, you know, it, it's, TTIP was started two and a half years ago. So that's just where we are. Uh, and trade negotiations take a certain incompressible amount of time. Uh, I don't know what that number is, but it's, you know, we, we concluded our trade agreement. I, I negotiated with South Korea in two and a half years. We've been negotiating with the Gulf Cooperation Council on a not very ambitious trade agreement for the last 29 years. So there you have it, two and a half, <laughs> 29. Uh, where's your, where's, where, where do you sit on that spectrum? Uh, and uh, I think it's not unsurprising that the TPP has come to maturity sooner, and frankly, good luck. Uh, I've said publicly and I continue to say it, we're delighted. We wish it every success. Uh, I think yes, I don't think there's a direct relationship between TPP and TTIP, but any, the success of any trade deal adds momentum. Uh, and so it's forward momentum, and I think it will be helpful to us. Um, in terms of our negotiation, in some ways it's going to be an easier sell than TPP, to be honest, when I'm on the Hill, 
talking to many people. I've had many congressmen uh, and senators say to me, I'm skeptical about an Asia deal, but I really believe in a European deal. I, I have actually yet to encounter the US legislature who is actually against a transatlantic trade deal. I mean, they all say they want to see the detail, but <laughs> the starting point is one of openness and positive. For the reasons you gave, shared values, we're both high wage economies, we're both high standard economies, uh, so in principle it should be a good fit. I don't think it's a more difficult deal because of the intensity of the interaction. I think it's a more difficult deal because we're both used to being bullies. Uh, we're, both used to, we're both used to being the biggest partner in the trade negotiation. Uh, when the Europeans negotiate with I won't mention a country because that might be taken invidiously, but you know, we're usually four, five, six, seven, eight times, 10 times, 20 times bigger than they are. So obviously the relationship, the trade negotiation relationship is that. The United States, the same thing. Uh, so I think we both are slightly inclined to think that the trade negotiation consists of saying, this is what I'd like, would you please agree? Uh, and unfortunately we're finding that we're doing that to you and you're doing that to us and we're both looking at each other and saying, hey, wait a minute, that's my role to do that. Uh, and I think that maybe is requiring a slight calibration of expectations from the negotiations, which maybe, uh, you know, we're both going to have to come down to earth a bit and recognize that actually we, 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 we both have a, an interest in this. But it's going to take a bit of time. And I mean, if we can finish it, which is our hope in the lifetime of this administration, and Mike Froman, the American negotiator, tells me he'd be in his office till midnight on the 20th of January. Is that when the inauguration <laughs> takes place? Uh, and I'm sure he will be because he's there till midnight every night. He's out at noon, I think. But, <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, but uh, you know, the, the reality is next year is an election year here in the United States. That makes things a bit more complicated. But we are going to try and do this. Uh, and we're all working. There's a, a negotiating session going on in Miami as we speak. Uh, so we're committed to try and completing this by the end of next year with this administration. Only time will tell whether we actually get there. I follow up on one particular piece of uh, uh, TTIP that has engendered real skepticism both among European publics and among uh, some uh, in, in our, our own uh, House of Representatives or Senate here, uh, which is the investor state dispute settlement okay. aspects of it. <laughs> oh, I write on investor state dispute settlement, and I actually am, am, am quite pro uh, in favor of it. But I'm wondering, particularly sort of how you see the issue playing in the European public. Uh, I think that it's it's often misunderstood, and the the language and anger we're hearing from some quarters in Europe is um, is strong. Yeah, I, it, uh, I mean, it's a subject, I must say, two or three years ago I'd never heard of, and frankly, I could have done without ever hearing of it. <laughs> you should all still take the class I'm offering on it, nonetheless. Yes, no, no, it's now a very important subject. I would strongly recommend you take the class. Um, no, it, and it's, I mean, I've had to now learn more about it than I ever thought I would have to know, and uh, I agree with you. I mean, it's, it's, it, it, it's, it's a subject whose, whose importance in the grand scheme of trade has been grossly overinflated. Uh, I mean, at its simplest, it's about monetizing compensation for companies who feel their investments in one way or another have been appropriated uh, by a foreign country and uh, where they would have difficulty getting that through the legislative official process of that country. Uh, I was doing some students earlier a few moments ago. The, the example I give in Europe is the Repsol, the seizure of Repsol, the Spanish uh, oil company in, in Argentina. It's classic. Argentinian government decides they want to nationalize it. They pass a law. They nationalize it. There's no point in going to the Argentinian courts to say, can I have my company back? They say, well, we passed a law. And it's perfectly legal in Argentina to seize this asset. Uh, the only thing you can do is go to international arbitration and say, hey, I invested billions in this company. Uh, I don't want necessarily, I don't want it back because I've understood the Argentinians have decided they want to keep it, but they've got to pay me. And how much do they owe me? And then you have an international panel of arbitrators who tries to put a fair money value on that. I, I think this is fairly basic and I, I, it's, it's why it's been a feature of every investment treaty. Uh, and in, by the way, it's a European invention. It was invented by the Germans, who were the first ones to develop uh, bilateral investment treaties going back 30 years. So it's rather paradoxical that the country, or the, the public in, in Europe that now is apparently most skeptical about investor state dispute settlement is indeed the, the German people, uh, whose companies are great users of it. I do understand why, um, because to a certain extent there has been uh, a bit of, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? lawyerly creativity uh, put into how this works. Uh, the Philip Morris case against uh, the Australian government about plain packaging of tobacco. 
uh, is for me something which should never have got to first base under ISDS. This is a public policy issue. Uh, the Italian, Australian authorities are perfectly entitled to take whatever means they need to protect the health of their citizens. And as long as they're not doing it in a discriminatory manner against foreign companies rather than domestic uh, companies, I don't really see why ISDS would become a means for resolving a disagreement over that. Uh, if this is deemed to be unfair to tobacco uh, companies, then they should go through the Australian courts. Uh, I don't think it's not a question of, uh, of appropriation of assets. I, I know there's an issue of the appropriation of intellectual property. I familiar with the case. But it, there's no doubt about it. It gave ISDS a bad name. Uh, there was also cases in Germany uh, over the uh, energy the, the, the uh, decision to withdraw from nuclear energy. A number of nuclear companies, including Vattenfall in, in Sweden, uh, came forward and said they wanted compensation. By the way, they are, they're slightly more case, because not so much they want to make the Germans go back and love nuclear energy, but they are saying, we sank a lot of money into building nuclear power stations, which now will never see the light of day, and we think we're entitled to be compensated, because we, we did so in good faith with legitimate expectation that this could, be, this could be brought to fruition. So I think what we've done in Europe is we've held an extensive public consultation on the issue. We really have tried to unpick the different elements that people don't like about this. Uh, and we had, I think, 150,000 uh, submissions, which shows you the degree of interest. Um, many of them rather similar. There appeared to be a website where you could sort of fill in your own why I don't like ISDS form and then got sent to the commission, but fair enough. Um, and we produced a report, and it's worth reading, uh, it's, it's on the website, about the main issues that people felt they had. And the main issues really came down to things like the transparency of the process, the risk of conflict of interest of the participants, because you had arbitrators who were litigators and litigators who were arbitrators, and it all looked a bit ad hoc, and it was behind closed doors, and it wasn't, uh, which is typical of a sort of traditional arbitration process. So what we have done is we have now come forward with a new proposal about how to renovate uh, ISDS, I like to call it the genetically modified version of ISDS, <laughs> making it more like a judicial process, so establishing panels of judges, who, people who say, I'm going to be an arbitrator, I, I'm not going to be a litigator, uh, and you can't just flip and flop between being one or the other, making it all hearings in public, uh, um, uh, having uh, the possibility for interest, other interested parties, civil society, or uh, groups who feel they, they have a stake in some of the issues to participate and to make submissions. Uh, and we think with that kind of renovated ISDS, we can still preserve the essence of the, 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 the mechanism, which I think is important. A final point, why is it important nonetheless to have it in an agreement between the EU and the US? Probably it will not be much needed between us, given that our domestic uh, legal systems are quite robust, but you never know. But more importantly, if we don't have it in an agreement between us on the basis that we think our league, we love each other's legal systems, how are we going to explain to our next trade negotiating partner that we want to have it with them? So we don't like your legal system. So, you know, there may be, there may be countries where we would think it was self-evident that we don't trust the legal system. But there may be countries where this would become a much more difficult political debate to say, I don't like your legal system. And you would basically put yourself in a situation, every time you have an investment negotiation, you'd have to have a first question would be, and what do we think of this, par this partner's uh, legal system? And I think that's an absolutely impossible situation in which to put ourselves. So I think we absolutely have to have such a clause between us. I think we can address some of the issues about how it works and the perimeter of it, making sure it doesn't uh, sort of spread out into uh, public policy areas uh, if you like, a means of attacking public policy rather than a means of defending yourself against uh, unfair discrimination as a, as a foreign investor in a country. Uh, and with that, I hope we can go forward with a, with a good model, uh, which can actually become a model maybe for future uh, investment agreements between us and other partners. Thanks. So I think the good process helps a lot, but I guess part of the problem is there are at or some fundamental public policy disagreements that aren't going to go away. And even if you have a vehicle that's not going to be subject to abuse, how do you reconcile those policy agreements in the name of uh, transparency and openness, but also uh, taking into account that different uh, nations do have fundamental differences? Food safety, uh, genetically modified uh, organisms, um, uh, public health, um, pharmaceutical pricing, you know, there are any number of issues where there just are really core disagreements. But 
now we've moved away from ISDS. Absolutely, yes. No, I mean, where we have core disagreements, uh, we're just going to have to agree to disagree. Uh, I mean, let me just give you two examples. Uh, we in Europe have banned the use of uh, uh, hormones in uh, beef. <coughs> Uh, because we felt that this was often abused excessively and that it created a health risk. Uh, we, the United States took us to the WTO, we lost the case. Uh, we, we lost the case, we, we think we still had a good case, but we lost it. But we're not changing the policy. Under no circumstances are we going to change a policy which is for us an issue of public health. And we have told this to the United States, and they know that in this trade negotiation, this issue is not on the table for negotiation. Um, and we will not change this policy. Uh, if the Americans want to export beef to the European Union, it's going to have to be hormone free beef. beef, beef. By the way, I negotiated two years ago a settlement with the United States of the WTO case precisely on that basis that we opened a special quota for hormone free beef. Uh, GMOs. Uh, we believe that we have a system uh, for the approval of GMOs which is uh, science based and, and rigorous, but which I accept is slow and is sometimes uh, not in full satisfaction. Of companies who produce uh, these products. This is not up for negotiation. That's it. We're not going to change this. So, I mean, you know, there are some fundamental issues where we will, we will agree to disagree. Uh, and that's the way it's going to be. There are some issues on the US side, not for me to say what they are, but some of you will know them, uh, where we know that the US isn't going to change. And we just have to accept that. Uh, because we are sovereign democracies on both sides of the Atlantic, and we know we couldn't sell a change in these issues uh, to, our, to our public. So I think we just have to be upfront about that. But I believe they are a minority of the global you know, trade environment and the economic interaction between us. And I think we can manage those differences uh, and at the same time produce a good trade. And you don't see those differences becoming a cover for protectionism? No, I don't, actually. I mean, you know, of course, that's what we will both, that's what we'll say on both sides. Uh, we will each, if it suits us, we'll accuse the others of protectionism. And, and you know, I, I'm not, uh, you know, I, I can only speak to the two issues that I know, that I've seen, that I've cited, uh, hormones and, and GMOs, I can tell you. There's no protectionism in that. It's just a deeply felt view of, of, of European public opinion. Uh, by the way, on GMOs, I'm personally rather more relaxed about it than the average European citizen. But that doesn't help you because the bulk of people in Europe are extremely skeptical. And it's not that they don't want GMOs. They, they, they accept that there will be GMO products, but they want them proved through a very you know, comprehensive process. Uh, and in some cases, uh, yes, they certainly want labeling. They want it clearly. They want to know if they're consuming a product that has GMOs in it. Personally, this I would never look at a label to know whether there's some GMO in, you know, in, it, in it. But that's me. You know, other people are different. My daughter will always look at the product label. Uh, so, you know, uh, so I don't think that's protection. The hormone issue is absolutely not. I can assure you there were huge abuses uh, of uh, growth hormones in Europe. Uh, there were legal limits for people were just pumping this stuff in, and there was scientific evidence that it was damaging, particularly to, to, young, to young people, uh, in, in, uh, to very, young, very young infants. That's a deeply held view in Europe. We're not going to change it. And the negotiators, the US negotiators know that. Uh, they maybe don't like it, but uh, it's not going to happen. And that's why I get angry when people in Europe say, oh, you're going to give up uh, all our cherished uh, positions on food safety and health. No, we're not. Any more than the Americans are going to give up some very cherished uh, views here about certain policies uh, uh, which they will not feel able to change, even much though we would like it and much though we would say some of these policies are protectionist uh, at origin, but we're just going to have to live with that. But believe me, uh, you know, trade agreements do not dismantle every ounce of barriers between countries. They simply make the position better after the trade deal than it was before. And that's, that's what we do. So uh, this is a fireside chat. And it's a cold enough day that a fireplace would be nice, but it's sort of missing. The chat part, however, is very much present in all of our wonderful students and faculty who wanted to, to come and, and join us today. So I want to open up the floor to them. And, and I will say you are a popular enough draw that we have people hanging off the rafters in the back. So we'll try to catch some eyes from different sides of the room. Uh, may I ask you to keep your questions short and have them end with a question mark? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Do you see the U.S. need to come to a deal 
Yeah, um, I mean, there are alternative, sorry, for those of you who don't know, this is uh, the um, issue of data privacy and the transfer of data across the Atlantic, uh, which was done under cover of a commission, European law uh, taken by the European Commission in 2000, which has just been struck down by judgment of the European Court following a, a court case in Ireland, which then referred the, the interpretation of European law to the uh, Court of Justice in Luxembourg. I mean, it's very important to know that this is on a point of law. There are two points of law, particularly which the decision was struck down. It's not, some people in America, I think, have seen this as somehow political judgment. I mean, it's a, it's, it's, it's a I mean, I'm not a lawyer, but you work in this business for long enough, you sort of become one. <laughs> uh, I've read the decision five times now, and I must say, I, reading the, 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 the reasoning of the court, it's hard to see how they could have reached any other decision. It was a flawed, the commission decision of 2000 is, in retrospect, is clearly flawed. Um, now, where does that leave companies? Well, it, it, there are other means for transferring data. Uh, I won't go into the details now, but the, the European data privacy law, protection law, does foresee other means than this for transferring data. So in the short term, companies can make sure that the data they're transferring is, is compliant with those other things. and the. Uh, data protection authorities, the national data protection authorities, who are the people whose job it is to oversee the respect of this legislation, have said that they will uh, they will give companies until January to find the alter, and they will only begin investigations after that moment. So companies, and I was in Silicon Valley and Seattle uh, last week, and I think the companies kind of know what they have to do and know how to do it uh, to, to to be on the right side of the law, uh, at least in the short term. But I agree, it's the, the other methods are rather more cumbersome. We would ideally like a new safe harbor arrangement. Uh, the Commission and the United States government have been negotiating on this. We were very close to an agreement. Now this judgment has arrived. So one of the first things we have to do is look at the state of negotiation between us and see whether that text that we'd almost finished stands up against the criticisms which the uh, Court of Justice has made. The point about this is this is not an international agreement. It is actually a decision of the European Commission uh, what you would call in, in your jurisdictional order here, an executive order, uh, which has to be approved by the member states and the European Parliament will also be consulted, though not legally necessary. So the point that Americans have to understand, this is not an international treaty between the US and the EU. This is a decision that the European Commission has to take and get approved by our, our domestic constituency. Uh, so when we disagree with the Department of Justice lawyers, who say, no, no, the text we have is fine, it fits perfectly with the agreement, with all due respect, they're not ultimately the ones whose you know, uh, who reputation will be on the line when this, when this comes to be judged. So I think we are going to have to take a few weeks uh, to look again at this text, revise it to make it fit with the court judgment, and hopefully find a way forward. More generally, I think we should have some kind of reflection, because this is not just the intersection of two jurisdictions, the European, the, the European jurisdiction and the United States. And by the way, there's a court a case going through the second court of, uh, in New York uh, of, the, of the Department of Justice seeking access to data in Ireland held by Microsoft, which is kind of the reverse side, because the Department of Justice wants access to this data uh, for some criminal prosecution, some criminal case they're pursuing. Uh, the Irish government are saying, and Microsoft are saying, you have to go through the procedures foreseen by the Treaty on Mutual Legal Assistance between Ireland and the United States. The United States government say, no, no, it's held by Microsoft, they're an American company, we don't care where the data is, we own it. Uh, and this is what's being fought out in the, in the US courts. So we are, we are at this intersection of our two respective jurisdictions. Some people in America said, how can the Court of Justice uh, affect data transfers in the United States? I could say, how can the Department of Justice think it can access uh, data uh, held in, you know, on European soil? And it's not just the intersection of two jurisdictions, it's the intersection of two worlds the world of data privacy and data protection, and the world of surveillance and law enforcement, which is also a form of protection for our citizens. So we're caught in a, in a bind. You're a citizen, you want to feel that your data is secure, but you also want to feel that someone's <coughs> protecting you from terrorists. Uh, which, which do you care more about? Uh, and, and frankly, we're grappling with these issues on both sides of the Atlantic. The debate you had here over the transition from the Patriot Act to the Freedom Act will show that you, you have exactly the same discussion here as we have in Europe. The problem is we've solved it in slightly different ways, and the ways we've solved it don't necessarily mesh together. So I think this is a conversation that we're going to have to continue to have for quite some time, even if we get a fix on the, the immediate problem. You mentioned earlier that the Court of Thank you. 
ongoing political discourse in that country concerning the negotiation, or do you assess more weight to what's said behind those doors? No, when you're negotiating, you negotiate with the person who's across the table from you who has a democratic mandate to be your negotiator. And frankly, it's their job to sell the deal to their constituency. So my commentary was not about, you know, that it, I felt that what was being said about NAFTA affected TTIP. We negotiate with the Obama administration. Uh, if the Obama administration signs a deal with us, it's their job to sell it domestically. And by the way, if we don't conclude with this administration and we're dealing with some other, and I'm not going to, <laughs> don't worry, I'm not going to fall into that trap. Uh, we're dealing with some other administration. Uh, we will rely on them to be able to, you know, if they sign a deal, they'll have to sell it, just as we have to sell any deal to our constituents. <coughs> My point was more general one of a feeling that somehow in this country, many people have lost sight of the benefit of trade. Uh, and that I find disappointing because this is a country who has benefited hugely from the trade deals you've done and who benefits hugely from globalization. I would say the United States, with many, in the minds of many people, is one of the great winners. I mean, you, you take China as a, as a manufacturing platform. The great example I quote in Europe is if you take the, the iPod, uh, you know, sells here for what, $165, maybe $5, it's made in China, maybe $5 goes to China, $160 uh, goes to Apple in California. Uh, that's globalization, and, and that's not the Chinese exploiting the American market, that's the Americans getting a very good deal out of China. So, you know, I, I think if you look at trade in terms of value added, rather than just in terms of volumes flowing across, uh, you would, if you looked at China's exchanges with the rest of us, uh, you would find that China is, yeah, it's doing quite well out of the trade, but we're actually doing even better. Uh, and I think that that's the explanation that you have to try and give to our public about the benefits of trade. It, 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 and, and NAFTA is the same. I'm sure some jobs went to Mexico, but I'm absolutely sure that there were many jobs here which were created uh, by exports to Mexico. So uh, I just wish that that debate was a bit more uh, lively here. Uh, yes, in the back. I'm sorry, I, I missed the, the, the last part. The question is, how, how do we reconcile the benefits of trade with the use of economic sanctions, uh, I assume, in, in certain conflicts or, or controversies? Yeah, but I mean, economic sanctions are, are political weapons. They're not, they're not, uh, they're not uh, trade, you know, they're not trade weapons. They're, they're, they're the, over, the political override of economic interests. And, and why, why do I justify it? Well, because, frankly, uh, sometimes it's a, you know, an extension of war by other means, and I'd rather see trade sanctions than I'd rather see war if I take the case of Iran. Uh, why did we take tough economic sanctions against Iran? Because the acquisition by Iran of military nuclear capabilities would have been an absolute disaster in the Middle East and, and globally. Uh, and the entire global community, by the way, including China and Russia, all backed the use of tough economic sanctions against Iran in order to get Iran to the negotiating table to agree a deal whereby they would give up forever the possibility of having a nuclear weapon. Now, I don't particularly like sanctions because I agree with you, they don't make economic sense, but they are better than the alternative, which might have been a military uh, option against Iran. So I think uh, there are times when sanctions are the best way forward. Sanctions against uh, Russia for the annexation of Crimea, for the destabilization of Eastern Ukraine, I'm sorry, uh, that's the least we should be doing. Uh, so I, I think, unfortunately, there are times when you need to make use of this uh, instrument, but it's not an economically rational instrument. Uh, in fact, in many cases, you're doing yourself economic damage. Uh, Europe suffered hugely from the Iran sanctions. Uh, Peugeot was one of the largest exporters to Iran. There was, there was at least one huge factory in, in France which closed because of their economic sanctions. Greece was a major importer of cheap Iranian oil, and they had to find alternative sources which were more expensive, right at a time of economic difficulty. So, and, and the sanctions against Russia are hurting Europe much, much more than they're hurting the United States. But we still do it because we believe in, in the political reasons why we have to send a strong signal that these situations are not acceptable, and we need to find solutions. Ambassador, I'm curious how uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership in many ways can serve as precedent for the U.S. EU negotiations over the trade agreement, and in particular, I was curious about the uh, on, uh, biologics and uh, agriculture. 
To be very frank, I haven't yet seen the TPP. Uh, None of us have. So I, 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 I can't and won't comment about what's in it and what that might mean for TTIP. Uh, to the extent that the US will tell us, well, what we've done in TPP is a template for what we'd like to do with you, that's their starting point. It's not the end point. Uh, if it's a good template, we might agree. If it's not a template that works for us, we'll say, well, that's what you did with the, with the Pacific, yeah, but that's not what you're going to do with us. By the way, as the Americans have quickly told us about Canada, when we've said, well, in, in the Canada Agreement, we've, we've achieved this with Canada, they say, well, we're not Canada. Which is true. Which is true. So uh, the answer is one trade agreement is never a, a, a precedent for another, uh, particularly when you're, you, you know, it's between two very equal partners, the point I made earlier. Uh, if the United States was now negotiating with a, a country which was kind of one-tenth their economic size, they might be able to say, well, what we've done in TPP represents what we expect you to do. And that might be a take it or leave it offer for that partner. I don't think the U.S. can make us take it or leave it offers, and we won't make take it or leave it offers in the U.S. Uh, let me see if there's anybody uh, in the back here. <laughs> But it's not, it's, it's a German way. Sorry, it's a European invention, ISDS. America, America simply took over. The Germans invented the Bilateral Investment Treaty. Uh, and Germany has, I think, 1,200 uh, bilateral investment treaties. And the, the ISDS clause that we're all using currently goes back to the very first uh, German investment uh, treaty. Uh, so it's, it's, not, it's not particularly American. Um, for us, uh, the, the problem is not uh, that it's American or German or... The problem is that it, it became a symbol of the fact that a trade negotiation, in fact, in this case, it's not a trade negotiation, it's an investment negotiation, by the way, it's very important. I mean, you don't have ISDS in, in, a, in a trade agreement, you have it in an investment agreement. Uh, in a trade agreement, you have a dispute settlement mechanism, which is different, and that's what you have in the WTO. Uh, there is no ISDS in, in, in the WTO because the WTO doesn't deal with investment. Uh, so there's no competition between ISDS and the dispute settlement mechanism of the WTO, which is, by the way, one of the great jewels in the crown of the, of the WTO, and, and which I, uh, we, are, we are big supporters. Even if we've sometimes lost cases, we've also won them. So that's the way it goes. Uh, and when you lose, you have to pay the price. Uh, when, when I say that you, you, when you, you don't implement a decision, you have to then you expose yourself to retaliation and to, and to compensation. Um, but going back to ISDS, um, the feeling was that it could become a means whereby corporations with deep pockets and very well-paid lawyers, some of whom probably graduated from this university, uh, and some of them hope to graduate from this university. Um, I have a daughter who's studying law in Georgetown, but she, she wants to do human rights, not corporate law. I'm, I'm hoping she'll change her mind before the, the, the course is finished, but anyway. <laughs> Uh, that this could be a means whereby corporations could basically twist the arm of governments not to take certain public policy decisions, uh, whether that's in the area of environment or whether that's in the area of public health or whatever. And that is what has grown up as the sort of you know, symbolism of this issue. Uh, and that is why we have tried to demystify this issue in Europe by having this public consultation, by producing a discussion paper on what we see as some of the criticisms that can be made and how we think that can be addressed in a genetically modified form of investor, student, investor state dispute settlement. And uh, we have put this forward, uh, and we will put this forward in the negotiation with the United States as our proposal. Going back to my point, it will be our starting point mm -hmm. in the negotiation. It probably will not be the end point in the negotiation because the Americans will have their view about whether they wish to genetically modify this proposal or not, or if they want to genetically modify what it might look like. Uh, if, I, if I read the Trade Promotion Authority Act, uh, in Congress, the Congress also had some, some of the ideas that are in there, some of the criticisms of ISGS are not a million miles away from what some of the NGOs were saying in Europe. So I think there, there can be some meeting of minds, but it probably will not be identical to what we put on the table as a starting point, but it probably will look a bit different from the current clause, because I think, I believe, going back to TPP, that even in TPP, 
the ISDS looks a bit different than the traditional. I haven't seen it, but I'm told there's even an exemption for, for tobacco, for example, is what I've seen in newspapers, um, which is, may cause some problems getting through Congress eventually. Uh, but so I, I think we're, we're, we're all moving in the same direction, which is we want to keep this as an essential element of investment treaties, because investors investing in foreign countries is a risky business. Uh, no matter how stable their regimes are, no matter how stable their legal system, it's always an element of risk. You need a guarantee that if things go wrong, there will be a mechanism whereby you can, you can get compensation. Uh, but that mechanism needs to be transparent, needs to be objective, needs to be professional, uh, and needs not to lead to a situation where countries feel they're being bullied by big corporations with deep pockets uh, into changing issues of public policy, which have got nothing to do with uh, investment as such. Well, I mean, there are a lot of countries not involved in these agreements, if you see what I mean. Um, I mean, I, you, you may be thinking in the case of TPP of China, um, uh, but in TTIP, for example, on, on, on our side, we have a big problem with Turkey, uh, which is uh, as a customs union with the European Union and which feels that it would somehow have to swallow whole what comes out of the negotiation without necessarily being, being, being a party to it. Um, look, I, I think... Uh, firstly, if I understand correctly, TPP <coughs> is a platform uh, which is open to other participants uh, because it's a multilateral agreement. I mean, TPP is, is quite different from TTIP, which is a classical <coughs> bilateral trade agreement between two big trading partners. TPP is, is, a, is a multilateral, <coughs> and if I understand correctly, also contains elements which are sort of bilateral specific. So there's something there about uh, US, Japan, there's something there about Australia, uh, Singapore, whatever, you know what I mean? So there's, there's bits that are common and there are bits that are bilateral. And if I understand correctly, the, the participants are in principle willing to accept a request from another partner to join if they, if they so wish. The, the challenge for all of us with China <coughs> Uh, and China would like an FTA with the, with the European Union. And for the moment, we, what we have said is we are negotiating an investment agreement with China, as we are, as is the United States. And to be very frank, when we talk to the Chinese about trade issues and about investment issues, we don't get the impression that they would be ready for the kind of ambitious trade deals that we do. Because they still continue to see themselves as an emerging country, as a country which has joined the WTO, which has done considerable opening up of the economy, but they still wish to maintain certain practices uh, which would be unacceptable to us in, in a trade deal. So to a certain extent, the investment treaty is a test case of whether China and the developed world can negotiate mutually interesting deals in an area of investment, which in principle will be interesting for both of us because we want to invest in China, and some of our companies complain a bit about what happens when you invest in China. Uh, appropriation of uh, intellectual property rights, uh, non-transparency of the rule of law. I mean, very often in China, the laws are very good, but the actual application at the local level is sometimes a bit more uh, arbitrary. Uh, so there are, there are issues for foreign companies investing in China. China is starting to be a net investor outside. China is taking a big interest in investing in Europe and they have sometimes complained to us that they've got burned in Europe when they've invested, that they've found that, the, that, that there were laws there that they didn't know about, that they were treated unfairly. So they would also like, a, 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 in terms of investing in Europe, a, a framework which would guarantee them uh, a level playing field in investing in Europe and, and clarity and transparency about how they could invest in Europe. So I think this is a good test case. If that works, I think we could then go forward, and I wouldn't exclude, uh, certainly speaking for the European Union, a free trade agreement with China, uh, it, would make, it would make sense in many ways, but it would probably require a, a degree of opening up of the Chinese economy, which to me, uh, for which China is not yet ready. But I, I think the same goes for other economies. Now, just to be clear, TIP is not a platform. It's not a platform that we intend to open to others. It's a bilateral deal. We have said we don't rule out the possibility if others wanted to join it. But frankly, I think everyone would be better off to wait and see what it looks like before they decide whether they want to join it or not, because other people may like it or they may not like it. But this is essentially a bilateral deal between the EU and the US. Uh, and when we've done that deal, which we still have to do, then we will see if when we publish it and we 
ratify it and everything else. If other people put their hand up and say, hey, I'd really like to be a party to that, maybe we can consider that. But we're not going to consider that while the negotiation is ongoing. I've gotten the signal that we unfortunately only have time for one more question, but we'll take uh, the last question from the gentleman here. Uh, but the EU, the EU doesn't have a common tax system, so don't you think that this agreement might be dangerous for, in order like, for tax competition, pushing the tax competition inside the EU even more? I'm thinking about countries like Luxembourg, Ireland, and we have, on the other hand, also proposal. Ireland? You've got some criticism of Ireland? <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> for a centralized VAT system? <coughs> well, we, we, in fact, I, uh, I met a professor who just written a book on, on tax law, uh, so I'm, which, I, which I'm going to read on the train back. Um, uh, look, we could say a lot. No, I, I, don't, I don't think that, firstly, I don't think that a trade deal has to harmonize tax law. Uh, and there's no trade deal I know that ever has tried to harmonize tax law between two jurisdictions. Uh, so I don't think that's necessarily a problem. Uh, in terms of what's happening within Europe, uh, as you know, uh, we don't have tax harmonization. We do have, uh, for indirect sales tax, value-added tax, as you say, we do have European rules, unfortunately decided by unanimity, which is a disaster. It would be much better if it was qualified majority, because it leads to all kinds of complexities in, in the system. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think you need uh, harmonized tax rules to... Uh, run uh, a common a single, a single market. By the way, you don't actually have harmonized tax rules in the United States either. There's a lot of differential between your states and between the federal level and the, the state level. But you do need rules against abuse, I agree. And uh, the question of uh, the work of the OECD on uh, base erosion uh, profit sharing, BEPS, uh, which is an attempt to address the, the issue of um, uh, forum, tax forum shopping by, by companies, uh, I do think in Europe we need a common corporate tax base because I think we should be more transparent about what it is. The ta I don't think you need this, a common tax rate, uh, but I think you need a common tax base. So I hope that can go forward. I know it's difficult. We need unanimity. Uh, and we are uh, investigating countries who may have given uh, unfair tax advantages to individual companies through the state aid rules. So I think we have all the tools needed to address abuse if, if they happen. I don't think we have to harmonize everything that moves. I don't think we need to have a single European tax rate, uh, either on corporate tax or on any other tax. But I do think we need transparency, uh, we need clarity, uh, and we also need uh, the, the, the means to uh, address situations where uh, com countries have uh, illegally used uh, tax as a, as a means of uh, artificial inducement for investment. And we, we have those rules through the state aid rules. There's going to be some rulings coming out uh, quite shortly from the European Commission on this issue. Uh, so I, I, I think uh, we have the tools necessary to address it. But I don't think that the trade agreement between the United States and, and Europe is in any way going to affect that because to the extent that is deemed to be happening, it's happening now. Uh, we don't need TTIP to do that. Uh, the investment rules permit uh, this kind of forum shopping uh, at the present time. And the TTIP, as far as I'm aware, will be silent on tax issues. It will not. So to be completely neutral on that issue. Ambassador O'Sullivan, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we really appreciate it. And everyone, please join me in thanking Ambassador O'Sullivan. Professors Jill Fish and Bill Burke White for leading this fireside chat so skillfully. But most of all, thank you, Ambassador Sullivan, for coming here tonight. Um, and I joined the Penn Law community and the broader Penn University community when I wish you luck when you testify before Congress tomorrow morning. You had a captive audience tonight, and we know that you will do the same tomorrow morning. Thank you, Ambassador.